How's everyone today? Hello. Hi. Happy Sabbath. Um, it's always an honor and it's always good for me and my family to be here. So I want to thank Pastor Nix for uh, the invitation. And um, I hope that we together can explore on the topic of today, which I've titled, Be Perfect. And we are basically are gonna go through a few concepts on perfection and what Jesus taught about perfection. You know, this is a big topic in the Adventist church. Uh, we consider ourselves as being uh, people um, with blessed light, expanded uh, knowledge about the biblical truths. And being so, we have had this legacy today because of the work of others in the past that went through a lot of trouble and investigation and time and investments financially and in every way to get to the bottom of every topic that we cherish today as, the, as Adventists. And uh, 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 being honest with you, uh, this is a very hard topic to take in a short time. Maybe one day we can have a couple of hours at least in one afternoon to talk about this topic. And um, I don't have a way to get away of the philosophical part of the Adventist church or the theology part of the Adventist church to try to talk about something that is going to help us to be ready for when Jesus comes soon. So allow me to go through a little bit of concepts philosophically, theologically, and then we're going to get to the point of how to be perfect. Because we all want to be perfect, right? We all want to go to heaven, right? We want to be in heaven. So let's, uh, let's do this together. Let's bow our heads so we can have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, please be with us now and help us to um, give ourselves to you. So you do what needs to be done in ourselves and through us, to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the book of Matthew was written by a tax collector. You know, they are not very popular, not even today, right? So he was not too popular either in his times. But when he saw Jesus and he heard him say, come follow me, he did leave everything and follow Jesus. And this tax collector became one of his disciples and the writer of this gospel, the book of Matthew. And in his book, he tried to write in a way that he could convince the Jewish people, specifically the Jewish members of that population, that, that see those cities surrounding, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so he uses a lot of comparisons with the Old Testament and some sayings of the Old Testament you'll find in his book, some prophecies you'll find in his book, and also some uh, uh, comparisons with Moses and Jesus you will find in his book. He's trying to appeal to the mind of the Jewish people who know, who know the law, who know uh, the, the traditions, the lifestyle of the Jewish people, and of course, by this time, the Jewish people is the only remnant of the people of Israel. You know, they were 12 tribes, and they became only one at the end, and Jewish people basically is what remained at this time when Matthew wrote this. He was appealing to those people who knew basically a lot of biblical stuff, to put it in a modern way. He knew, they knew, and they were trying to understand then as they read, uh, as these letters or these books were read in the churches, they were trying to understand, uh, you know, what was Jesus' role as the Messiah, you know, from the perspective of being an, an Israelite or a Jewish person. So Matthew writes in such a way that he tries to be deep and at the same time be simple. He doesn't void the deepest, uh, um, I would say, sayings and 
knowledge of, he doesn't consider that to be something that he doesn't need to address, but he puts it in there, and then he tries to elaborate and try to convince the people. He used a lot of parables and stuff, and you can see that he's trying to uh, acknowledge also that he is, uh, he realizes that the church then was a church mixed with people that are, uh, in today's language, faithful and unfaithful. People that are right and not right. People that are, that are trying to really uh, be uh, in a good relationship with God, and then people that just go with whatever. And the churches today are composed by the same kind of people. So uh, one of the examples that we can find how he applies the Old Testament is, is when Jesus is talking about the end, right? And uh, Matthew 23, 24, 25, 26, basically. And these areas, uh, Jesus uh, is talking about uh, the book of Daniel, basically, refers to Daniel. This is Matthew who, ref you know, compi comp uh, compiles these, uh, these stories and puts them there. And Jesus is, you know, using from the Old Testament the concept into the New Testament. This is uh, all Matthew as well. So Matthew is talking to people who understands the traditions, the laws of the Israelites, and the expectations of the Jewish in every way. And what is coming here to come is that in the book of Matthew, he tries in the end to make possible that every Jewish people can understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the true God who came to save every human being. But you know, he also has to um, overcome or try to overcome many realistic facts in his times. For example, the Jewish people was a people that was uh, basically um, occupied by the Roman Empire. And the Jewish people were basically treated as, uh, you know, um, diminished people. I don't want to say specifically slaves, even though they were kind of, but slavery by then in the Jewish area was not necessarily doing work for a Roman all day long for free. You know, they had their freedom, relatively freedom, but they have to, you know, comply with the laws of the Roman Empire, basically. So... Matthew had to also keep that in mind so they understand the message that is important so they can be ready for the kingdom of God, which Jesus was preaching about. So, this is how he basically navigates in the beginning of his book and gets us to the chapter 5 with the biggest sermon ever preached. A sermon that is known to be the strongest, more uh, broad, you know, relating to many topics, and also the longest register in the Bible by Jesus Christ. And in this sermon, we find rules that had to do specifically with the new kingdom, meaning that all the Jewish people that were living then with the old way of thinking, thinking that the Roman people were all enemies, that the Roman people were all bad, you know, generally speaking, that anybody who was not a Jewish was somebody that had to stay away from them. They were the chosen. They were the special people to God. They kept, uh, you know, uh, basically preserved the religion, the true religion of the world. So they were these people that, yes, were special. Yes, were going to, to have the Messiah from them, given and give, it, give him to the world. But at the same time, the Jewish people, now we're going to have to understand the new rules of the kingdom. That's why you hear or read in the book of Matthew many times, when Jesus says, you heard that this is how it was before, or this is what it was said, but I tell you this and this and that. 
This happens many times uh, in the book of Matthew. And Jesus, with the new kingdom, is trying to establish the rules of every citizen that is going to be part of this kingdom. And if you notice, even from the beginning, even in the book of Matthew that was dedicated to Jewish uh, audience, even then, even in that book, you can see that Jesus is trying to make a big, big change in the mindset of any Jewish or related to Jewish or Judaism. Trying to let them know that the kingdom of God is not only for the Jewish people, but for every single inhabitant of the planet, for everyone. Jesus opens a door that had never been touched, and he starts preaching a message that is going to change everything, that new rules, new laws, new concepts, new ideas, that, is go that, that this is going to change forever. Religion, specifically the religion that Jesus himself Established. So, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, where the Sermon of the Mount starts, is where we find this idea of perfection taught by Jesus Christ. But let me first mention that in the Old Testament, we also have an idea of perfection. And I want to read a paragraph, allow me to do this, please, uh, from a short article written by Kyle Butt and... Doctrinal Matters, he's talking about uh, the concept of perfection in the Bible. Uh, and he says, a brief study of the original work quickly shows that the Hebrew and Greek words that frequently are translated perfect in the English Bibles do not always mean sinlessness. Basically, he's saying, right, the original word in Hebrew, which is tam, and the, the, uh, the original word in, in Greek in the New Testament, which is teleios, are not necessarily meaning sinlessness, meaning is, it doesn't mean that you have no sin. What does it mean then? He continues to say, in, in their monumental work, their theological word book of the Old Testament, Harris, Archer, he cites, and Waltke address specifically the word used in the book of Job 1.1, the Hebrew word tom. And is, this word is translated as perfect, but he continues to say, doesn't necessarily mean this, but this means integrity of mind or innocence. And what is integrity of mind? This concept of integrity was very absorbed by myself, by my hair, my ears, my skin, my clothes, everything when I was in the army. I always heard the word integrity, but I never understood it completely until I was in the army, which, you know, it was every day, almost every hour, somebody was saying the word integrity, integrity. Even so that, that in our platoon, we got to a point that when anybody, no matter who, soldier, sergeant, uh, officer, it doesn't matter who, it didn't matter who, Whenever somebody did something that was not like clearly right, everybody with, you know, like a, in a choir will, will kind of say, integrity, soldier, integrity. As a choir, and the one in fault will look back and say, oh. and then everybody would say many times, integrity, integrity. Integrity doesn't mean perfection, but it means, I would say, coherence, in the sense that when you try to do right, you also, right, you have your whole body concentrated, aiming for that thing that you want to do, whatever it is that you want to do it right. That's integrity. That you keep a coherence. You say something, you keep trying to do that something, you end up doing that. And then if you fail, you keep trying to do that. And if you fail again, you try again and again. That is the sense of perfection in the Old Testament. And according to this concept, when we look at the book of Job, that he was referred to be a perfect a man, gentleman, he clearly was not. 
Because when we read the Bible, we, we read somewhere else that there is not anybody in this world that is or has been perfect. Except who? Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ. So nobody in the end, realistically speaking, will be perfect in any sense. For example, let me uh, refer to this like a work of art from Raphael, this artist who was perfect. But he had a bunch of students doing work for him, too. And he was not in himself perfect. He had to go through it time after time after time. I hear the story of another painter that was hired to paint a rooster. And, you know, I love the photos and paintings of roosters. I don't know why. But, you know, they're beautiful. And months and months went by, and the man who paid him said, okay, let me see. I haven't heard anything from you, but let me see what you have for me. Is my paint, painting ready? Oh, he said, oh, no, no, it's not ready. What? It's not ready? But I can do it in a short time. Just wait for me. Uh, give me five minutes, uh, and then come here. And he took his uh, brushes and started in the canvas painting a rooster. And in 10, 15, 20 minutes, he had a perfect rooster. And the man said, but I paid you a lot of money for this short time. You can do this. And then he went to another room with him and showed him how many canvases he had tried to do this time after time. And it wasn't perfect until he learned how to do it perfect. So integrity or perfection in the Old Testament doesn't mean sinlessness. It implies blameless me, blame, blame, uh, being blameless, uh, but because somebody gave you that, not that you earned it yourself. In the New Testament, then, we have another idea of perfection, and it has to do with love based on the teachings of Jesus. But when we talk about perfection in the Adventist church, specifically, we come to a point where we had to stop and think a little bit about this concept of, of perfection in the Adventist church. And um, we all want to be perfect. Again, we all aim to be perfect. We require of others to be perfect. It's even harder to have kids. And as you raise them, you, you do everything possible so they be perfect. And we look at the mirror, we look at the family, and we say, we say we're not perfect. And I don't think we'll ever be. What am I doing? Am I fooling myself, expecting every day that everything is perfect? But you know, we try. We try very hard. Seriously, we try. But as we understand why at this point in life, some people think that we have to be perfect before we go to heaven, it is impossible. I had a professor from Mexico when I was doing my bachelor's in theology in, theology in Dominican. I was very young, very... Uh, I don't know, I, I, I really give my soul to everything I try to do. Anyways, he told me one day, Ricardo, you know, we don't have to be perfect. We are still on this side of the millennium. And I said, well, what do you mean? Yes, Jesus comes and then millennia, the millennium starts, right? But if we are before the millennium, Jesus is not here yet. He has not made us perfect. So we are not perfect. We won't be perfect, but we try, yes. But we are on this side of the millennium. Now, I want to be perfect. We aim, we have to, I believe that we have to aim to be perfect. But what happens when we, frust we are frustrated because we don't achieve perfection and we hardly see anybody being perfect. So... How can we be perfect? What is the, cheat, the teaching of Jesus about perfection? Let me please touch now a little bit about the philosophy of perfection in our church and the theology. 
uh, Wagoner and Jones, pioneers of our church, they thought that in order to go to heaven, we had to be perfect in every conduct. That means in our behavior, we had to be perfect. This set kind of a foundation for M. L. Andreasen, who was a theologian in the Adventist Church that was prominent in the 1920s and on up to the 50s. M. L. M. L. Andreasen, who wrote, uh, he wrote a book, uh, and in this, in his book, basically, he said that before Jesus gets back to the earth, somebody, somewhere in the planet Earth will have to be perfect fulfilling the law or keeping the law. And only then, after one person, person at least, is perfect, then Jesus will come to earth and take us all to heaven. And this was called the last generation theology. I don't know if you've heard of that. This is something that is in our history very very rich times theologically since the end of the 1800s and all the way up to the 50s, early 50s. And in the early 50s, we, we had our Bible commentaries written by the, uh, our denomination, uh, wrote, composed a set of books, Bible commentary, commentaries that you know, try to explain almost every verse of the Bible from the per perspective of Adventists, but trying to be really, really faithful to the biblical uh, truth. And I say try because it is, it's very hard to do sometimes because these are, the, 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 the Bible is an old ancient book that we don't have all the originals, uh, you know, papers or, you know, pieces of skin where these truths were first written. So we have copies after copies that come to us. But what happened was that when uh, Andreasen thought about last generation theology, people liked that because they said, then Jesus can come really soon. All we have to do is try to be perfect. Have you heard that before or read it in the Bible before? The Pharisees came before the Jesus time and they created some extra laws to keep the laws of the Old Testament so they are faithful, so the Messiah comes and they become a prominent nation. The Pharisees did that. And they were, uh, basically, they were originated before, before Jesus' birth. In, a, in the Adventist church, this truth was very popular. And this basically was, I'm going to quote from a book written by George Knight, and the book is called... Uh, in search of uh, identity. And uh, this, uh, this book uh, shows specifically, specifically where Andreasen came from, and he came from a quote taken from the book Christ's Object Lessons from Ellen White that says, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Page 69. Christ's object lessons. What happened was that Andreasen created theology, not quoting the Bible, but quoting Ellen White. And in the Adventist church, we have a principle. Theology is done from the Bible. And we use Ellen White books as a complementary help, basically, to put it that way. In other words, we all agree on this, this is the bigger light, and Ellen White is the smaller light, so to speak. She herself said this. Anyways, when Andre Asen taught this, in those times, we had many, many problems in the world, and I would like uh, Harold to show me those slides that I asked him to get some slides. We had wars, the 30s, the 40s. In my country, there was a dictator that was dictator for 30 years, from 1930 to the 60s, 30-some years to the 60s. And then all these wars brought famine in the world. Everything was difficult to get. 
everything stopped. That's when women started to have to go to work in factories and offices to keep the war going also, right? So um, the war was very, very difficult. Many people were going through a lot of problems. Socially speaking, here in the States, there was, there was uh, discrimination against people of color, very strong still, even though slavery was done, finished, in the 1800s. And also, politically speaking, everybody that can give you a hint of being Marxist or being like a communist was taken to jail by the federal authorities, interrogated, tortured maybe, and it was a very, very troubled time in the United States and also in the world. We had like three, four presidents in Dominican Republic in a few years, in the 60s. And here, there was trouble, and there were trouble everywhere. Israel was established in the 47, 48, 46, 47, 48, actually 47, I believe. And then Israel, also a lot of problems with the Palestinians. The world was upside down. Just like today, right? Just like today. But then, with all these, the evangelicals heard that the Adventists were having a theology based not on the Bible, but in the writings of Ellen White, and they said, the Adventist church is a cult. I don't know if you remember those times. And the Adventist church was a cult, and there was a big, scaring, you know, reaction on the Adventist church, and everybody was saying, no, we are not a cult. And we tried to say, we are not a cult. And we tried to explain. Then the conference, general conference said, okay, Let's take this seriously, and let's have Leroy Froome and Pastor Anderson write a book called Doctrines, uh, I'm sorry, Answers on Doctrines. And this book was published to answer all doctrinal questions to the world, specifically the United States, because cult here was a big thing. It was very close to Marxism, communism, and everything. Remember Gene James a little later? All that stuff. All that stuff. So, so the United States is reading now that the Adventist church is not a cult. And they say, that's right. The Adventist church is not a cult. Because the Adventist church took the time to explain that our doctrine comes from the Bible. Amen. And then, when Andrea Asen saw that, he got mad, and you know, back and forth, blah, blah, blah. And the 60s were a time in the Adventist church of uprising of many groups opposing the change or the correction of the doctrines that we had. That's when we had several fundamentalist groups in the church somewhere in the world. They were originated after these, basically, uh, mainly. But anyways, perfection was a prerequisite for the second coming of Jesus. And this being put only on the responsibility of a human being. And this theology is wrong biblically. Because if it would depend on the man, on the human being, for Jesus to come, he will never come. His sacrifice was because no one in the world, as a human, can achieve perfection except Jesus Christ. And not because he was also God, but because he gave himself to the will of the Father. And he came as the second Adam to fulfill what we couldn't. And he gave us for free that salvation that he is ensuring for us. So salvation and the second coming of Jesus does not depend on the human being, but on Jesus Christ. The only thing is that we have to accept it, recognize it, call it however you want. But then in the Adventist church was another situation. When the general conference corrected this, many people didn't like it because it's easier to think that I want to make sure that things are my way. And many people st stayed, still think today that we have to be perfect before Jesus comes or he will never come. This is not in the Bible. 
perfection, how it is achieved. Jesus said how, and we'll go there now, in a minute, in a second, in a few seconds. But again, brothers and sisters, friends, and those who are online watching this, perfection is achievable the way Jesus taught. But the fact that we have to be completely perfect, seamlessly, it is impossible for the human being. Because sin is not something like a, like a behavioral issue. It's not about learning how to say, hello, good morning, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you, goodbye, and a smile on the face. It's not about conduct, behavior. It's about the inner, the inner being. Inside, we are sinners. We were born sinners. And the only time when we will be perfect is, Paul says in the Bible, when Jesus comes and he will take us to the clouds. And then after we start the journey to the holy city up there in heaven, we will be transformed in a blink of an eye, Paul says. And we will be turned, we will be turned from corrupt into uncorrupted. That's when only we will achieve perfection to this point. And again, we are on this side of the millennium. We are not perfect. We will not be perfect. So anybody else is. Then, therefore, Jesus taught, do not judge because you will be judged. And with the same measurement that you use, or the you know, measurement tool you use to measure others, you will be also measured. And that's why Jesus said, you are brothers and sisters, you shall love one another. And the world will understand that you are my people when you love one another. But again, what did Jesus teach about perfection? Matthew 5.43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This was the Jewish way of thinking then. They thought like that and it was okay. It was perfect. It was justified. Who wants to be a slave? Who wants to be, live in a nation, your own nation, when you are being occupied by a foreign nation? Nobody then it was right to think this way. Jesus said, you have been told, hate your enemy. Bless, but then, I'm sorry. But then, but I say to you, verse 44, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That is no hard task. I mean, no easy task. It's very hard. It's very hard to love your enemy. Do you agree with me? It's not easy. It's even harder to love someone that you see every day or every month or every year, whatever, whenever, that oppresses you, that does something on purpose so you have suffering or you don't have a good day or whatever. That is not easy. But the new rule from the kingdom in the Sermon of the Mount says, love those who persecute you. Love your enemy. That is the new rule. And he continues to say, that you may be sons of your fathers in heaven. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, but in the maybe over a year and a half, or so, people have started to talk on, the, on social media about what does it really mean to be son or sons of God? Have you noticed that topic somewhere? You know, some people have talked about it a lot. I mean, and it's a big deal in some circles. People expand and say and say, and they try to establish who is a son of God or daughter and who is not. Jesus said this. It's clear. He says... Love your enemies, pray for those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? That's easy. To love who loves me? That's a given. See, somebody says hello to me, it's easy to say hello back. But Jesus is talking about something deeper. Do not even the tax collector do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collect collectors do so as well? Remember, a tax collector is talking here, Matthew. Therefore, 48, you shall be perfect. Some versions say, you must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, how can I be perfect? Well, I just uh, want to say a few more things before we go home today. But listen, every time big events happen, like the ones we've been through since 2020, pandemic, war, injustices, famine, scarceness of mainly everything, unbalancing, you know, all industries have delays on everything because everything is not the same since 2020. Preachers come, they have big conferences, they preach Jesus is coming because the signs show us that he is coming and I believe he is coming. But notice that these signs repeat every so often in history. And notice that people repent in bulk. Multitudes come to Christ. They accept Christ. And nothing changes. In churches, like Matthew says, we still have the experience of having people, some of us that are unfaithful, some of us that are faithful, and we have Problems that are not supposed to happen among Christians. And every so often comes somebody and teaches us or tell us, see these signs, all these wars, uh, this economy, the way it is, this world is going to end soon, repent. People repent. Nothing changes. Ten years later, the same. Five years later, the same. Two years later, the same. Every year, the same. Why? The church doesn't change. And I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying generally speaking, in order for us to grow, we have to realize where we are. Otherwise, we will never grow. And why does the church stay the same? Generally speaking again. Eh? And the things that we need to change are in the Bible, have been there for 2,000 years in the Sermon of the Mount. In the four Gospels, Jesus is quoted so many times. So it feels like he is the one talking there. And he, time after time, says, there are two commandments that are important. Love God above everything and your neighbor as yourself. If we do that, the church won't change back and forth, up and down, every so often, according to the political, social, and religiously, or whatever situation there is in the world. But we will stay changed if we embrace the gospel, the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. He teaches the way. He is the way. He, can, he already told us what to do. All we have to do is listen to that. You know what? Jesus himself said in John chapter 17, the world will believe that I am God when you love one another. And I'm not saying we don't love one another. But even though we are not perfect, we accept each other and we embrace and we forgive and we move on and we keep walking together as a family. Don't you do that in your family? You practice in your house, in your home, 
to come to church and find another family a little bigger. And then you go to the neighborhood, the family is a little bigger. And then you go to the city and then it's way bigger. And then to the state, to the country, to the world, it's even bigger, but still one family. Same principles will change the world for good. And then we will be perfect. Remember, perfect is not being perfect, as we understand in English. When you go to the dictionary in English, what it says is perfect, no failure, no blame, no nothing. It's like when you go to a painting, somebody painting a car, and the paint is perfect. You say, wow, perfect. I don't find anything wrong with this paint. And you love it, right? That's perfect in English. Also in Dominican Republic, in Spanish. <laughs> but in the Bible, perfect is different. It's trying to do your best. No matter what you fall, you get up and try again. And if, if there is a problem, a situation, in between me and somebody, we try to move on to, to make peace and forget and forgive. That is being perfect. It doesn't mean that we will not do it again, maybe. It will happen again, possibly. It will be a mess again, yes. But being perfect means we hug ourselves again, and then we forgive, and we keep going. Because this, this here is not even the beginning of the pains there will be, according to the Bible, in the real end. There's a concept in the Bible that is, uh, in the Old Testament, um, the end. And there's another concept that is the end of the end. We might be in the end, but most theologians, they believe we're not in the end of the end. We still have more to go. You know? We still have more to go. And in the meantime, what are we going to do? I call for try to be perfect. Biblical concept. And if Jesus comes tonight, then we'll be ready. But if we only try to be perfect in our behavior and not do the extra steps that Jesus is teaching, then Jesus may come tonight or in two years. And possibly we won't be in heaven, even though we try hard. We have to try the way of Jesus. You know, he gave the Old Testament, and he came and explained it. We really need not much more. He was the giver, then he taught it, and then he, he preached it, he lived it. What else? You know, sorry to do this, but I, I do it in a funny way. You know what I mean? We have to understand these simple principles are powerful, and they may make us perfect if we let it, if we let them. So may God bless us, and may God help us to be perfect and help others to enjoy that perfection as we go along together in this struggle until he comes. May God bless you.